2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Do we begin again to commend ourselves, or do we need, as some others, epistles of commendation to you, or letters of commendation from you? You are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. <clears throat> so, epistles of commendation. Such letters were common and necessary in the early church. A false prophet or an apostle could travel from city to city and easily say that Paul sent me so you should support me. So to help guard against problems like this, letters of recommendation were often sent with Christians as they traveled. And so Paul himself sent letters of commendation on many occasions. In Romans 16 verses 1 and 2, it'll say, I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church of Centria, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, and assist her in whatever business she has need of you. For indeed, she has been a helper of many and of myself also. As well as 1 Corinthians 16, verse 3. And when I come, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. In verse 10 and 11 of that same chapter, 1 Corinthians 10. And if Timothy comes, see that he may be with you without fear, for he does the work of the Lord, as I also do. Therefore let no one despise him, but send him on his journey in peace, that he may come to me, for I am waiting for him with the brethren. As well as Second Corinthians chapter 8, verses 16 through 23. Right? But thanks be to God who puts the same earnest care for you into the heart of Titus. So now is going to describe his letter of recommendation. So Paul has... A letter of recommendation but it's not written on paper Paul says that the letter is written in our hearts and it's known and read by all men so there was nothing wrong with a letter of commendation written on paper but how much better to have a living letter of commendation so the Christians at Corinth along with groups of Christians wherever Paul had worked were Paul's living letter to validate his ministry so the best analogy in today's world might be a certificate of ordination Many people think that a certificate of ordination means that you have the credentials of ministry. While there is an important purpose in public ordination to ministry, a piece of paper in itself never is a proper credential. The true credentials of the ministry are changed lives, living epistles. We might also say, keep your paper to yourself and show us the changed lives from your ministry. And so nothing so commends a minister as the proficiency of his people. The fruitfulness of the people is the preacher's testimonial. And many think that the main reason God granted the miraculous signs and wonders among the apostles in the book of Acts is to serve as a letter of commendation to their apostolic ministry. If this was the case, it makes sense that the miraculous gifts of the Spirit would cease when the apostles passed from the scene, because there would no longer be an apostolic ministry to authenticate. However, it is significant that Paul does not say miracles are our epistle of commendation. Paul apparently did not believe his primary letter of recommendation was found in the miraculous signs, but found in the miraculously changed lives. Verse 3. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. So Paul's letter of recommendation has an author, which is Jesus Christ. The Corinthian Christians were indeed Paul's letter of recommendation, yet he realized that he did not write that letter. Jesus did. Paul is not trying to say, I made you the Christians that you are, but he is saying, God used me to make you the Christians that you are. And so Paul's letter of recommendation was written with a pen, and the pen was Paul himself. He wrote into the lives of the people he served. And Paul's letter of recommendation was written with ink, and the ink was the Holy Spirit. And Paul's letter of recommendation was written on paper or tablets, and the paper was the hearts of the Corinthian Christians. And so the Old Testament prophets looked forward to the New Covenant, when the law of God would be written in our hearts. That's found in Jeremiah 31, verse 33, where it says, But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds, and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And it said that God would grant hearts of flesh to replace the hearts of stone. Ezekiel 11 verse 19, where it says, Then I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within them, and take out the stony heart out of their flesh, and give them a heart of flesh. 
And Ezekiel 36 verse 26 will also say, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. All right, verses 4 through 6. And we have such trust through Christ towards God, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. So Paul knows that what he had just written might sound proud in the ears of the Corinthian Christians. After all, it's no small thing to say, you are my letter of recommendation and I am a pen in God's hand. Paul knows that these are big ideas, but his place for thinking these big ideas is in Jesus, not in himself. And Paul doesn't consider himself sufficient for the great task of changing lives for Jesus. Only Jesus is sufficient for such a big job. Some people refuse to be used by God because they think of themselves as not ready. But in a sense, we are never ready or worthy. If we were, the sufficiency would be in ourselves and not from God. So our sufficiency is of God. So let us practically enjoy this truth. Right? We are poor, leaking vessels, and the only way for us to keep full is to put our pitcher under the perpetual flow of boundless grace. Then, despite the leakage, the cup will always be full to the brim. And so the idea of the new covenant was prophesied in the Old Testament in uh, Luke thir- or Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31, where it says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And that was put into practice by Jesus in Luke 22, verse 19 and 20, where he says, And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. So the ancient Greek word for covenant, diatheke, uh, has an original meaning of the last will and testament. Paul's use of the word reinforces the sovereignty of God because it's not a negotiated settlement but a divine decree. The word covenant describes an arrangement made by one party with plenary power, which the other party may accept or reject but cannot alter. A covenant offered by God to man was no compact between two parties coming together on equal terms. This new covenant presses the terms by which we can have a relationship with God, which is centered on Jesus and his work for us. And so when Paul contrasts the letter and the spirit, he isn't favoring experience over the word, nor is he favoring allegorical interpretation over a literal understanding of the Bible. Rather, Paul shows the superiority of the new covenant over the old covenant. So the letter is the law in its outward sense, written on the tablets of stone. The letter of the law came by the old covenant. It was good in itself, but it gave us no power to serve God, and it didn't change our heart. It simply told us what to do. Paul can say that the letter kills because of the law exposing our guilt. It kills us before God. The law thoroughly and completely establishes our guilt. And Paul expresses this point well in Romans chapter 7 verses 5 and 6 where he says, For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we would serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So the indwelling spirit then becomes for us a law written on our hearts. He is in us to guide us and be our law. It isn't that the Holy Spirit replaces the written law, but it completes and fulfills the work of the written law in our hearts. The spirit gives life, and with the spiritual life, we can live live out the law of God. So therefore, we cannot throw away or neglect our Bibles, which some might say is the letter, because now we have the spirit. Instead, the Spirit makes us alive to the letter, fulfilling and completing the work of the letter in us. So we shouldn't think that this is permission to live our Christian life on experiences or mystical interpretations of the Bible. Experiences and allegories in the Bible have their place, but each must be proved true and supported by studying the literal meaning of the Bible. The Spirit and the letter are not enemies, but friends. They don't work against each other, and one is incomplete without the other verse 7 through 11. But if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. 
For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. So was it wrong to call the old covenant the ministry of death? Well, no, because that is what the law does to us. It says that we are guilty sinners before God so that we can be resurrected by the new covenant. It isn't that the problem was with the law, but with us. And Romans chapter 7 verse 5 will say the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. And so on the ministry of death, David was the voice of the law awarding, sin, uh, awarding death to sin. He shall surely die. Uh, Nathan was the voice of the gospel awarding life to repentance for sin. Thou shalt not die. And so there was glory associated with the giving of the law and the old covenant. At that time, Mount Sinai was surrounded with smoke. There was earthquakes, thunder, lightning, a trumpet blast from heaven, and the voice of God himself in Exodus 19, verse 16 through chapter 20, verse 1. And most of all, the glory of the old covenant was shown in the face of Moses and the glory of his countenance. So Exodus 34, verse 29 through 35 will describe how Moses put a veil over his face after speaking to the people. As glorious as the radiant face of Moses was, it was a fading glory, which glory was passing away. The glory of the old covenant shining through the face of Moses was a fading glory, but the glory of the new covenant endures without fading. And so if the old covenant, which brought death, had this glory, then we should expect greater glory in the new covenant, which brings the ministry of the Spirit and life. The old covenant was the ministry of condemnation, but the new covenant is the ministry of righteousness. The old covenant is passing away, but the new covenant remains. So no wonder the new covenant is much more glorious. The old covenant had glory, but the glory of the new covenant far outshines it, just as the sun always outshines the brightest moon. Uh, compared to the new covenant, the old covenant had no glory because of the glory that excels in the new covenant. Verse 12 through 16. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away, but their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament, because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. So, since our hope is in a more glorious covenant, we can have a more glorious hope. Because of the hope, Paul can use great boldness of speech. The old covenant restricted and separated men from God. The new covenant brings us to God and enables us to come boldly to Him. And so, even Moses did not have real boldness under the old covenant. A veil is not a bold thing to wear. It is a barrier and something to hide behind. Moses lacked boldness compared to Paul because the covenant that he ministered under was fading away and fading in glory. So from reading the account in Exodus 34 verse 29 through 35, one might first get the impression that Moses wore a veil after his meetings with God so that the people wouldn't be afraid to come near him. The veil was to protect them from seeing the shining face of Moses. Here. Paul explains the real purpose of the veil, not to hide the shining face of Moses, but to hide the diminishing glory of his face because the glory was fading. The passing glory of the old covenant contrasts with the enduring glory of the new covenant. And so since the veil hid the face of Moses, the children of Israel couldn't see any of the glory from his face. Therefore, the contrast isn't only between passing glory and enduring glory, but it's also between concealed glory and revealed glory. And Paul says that most of the Jews of his day could not see the glory of Moses' ministry faded in comparison to the ministry of Jesus because the veil remains unlifted. They cannot see that the glory of Moses' ministry has faded and they should now look towards Jesus. Since the same veil that hid Moses' face now lies on their hearts, they still think that there is something superior or more glorious in the ministry of Moses. And so Paul could say of his fellow Jews that a veil lies on their heart. But he could also say that the veil can be taken away in Jesus. Paul knew this well because he was once veiled to the glory and superiority of Jesus. And that there are many Christians with a heart to preach to their Jewish friends wonder why it's rarely so simple as just showing them that Jesus is the Messiah. This is because a veil lies on their heart. Unless God does a work in them so they can turn to the Lord and have the veil taken away, they will never see the fading glory of Moses' covenant and the surpassing glory of Jesus and the new covenant. And so, of course, it could be said that the Jews are not the only ones with the veil on their heart. Uh, Gentiles also have veils that separate them from seeing Jesus and his work for us clearly. 
and Jesus is more than able to take those veils away. This points to the essential need of prayer in evangelism. It's been rightly said that it's more important to talk to God about men than it is to talk to men about God. But we can do both of these important works. Verse 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So from the context of Exodus 34, verse 34, we can see that when Paul says the Lord is the Spirit, he means that the Holy Spirit is God, just as Jesus and the Father are God. So Paul's thinking is going to follow like this. When Moses went into God's presence, he had the liberty to take the veil uh, off, and uh, the presence of the Lord gave him this liberty. We have the Holy Spirit, who is the Lord. We live in the Spirit's presence because he is given to us under the new covenant. So just as Moses had the liberty to relate to God without the veil and the presence of the Lord, so we also have liberty because of the presence of the Holy Spirit. And so we should also consider what Paul is not saying. He is not giving license to any Pentecostal or charismatic excess because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. We have great liberty in our relationship with God through what Jesus did and through what the Holy Spirit is doing. But we never have the liberty to disobey what the Spirit says in the Word of God. That is a perversion of true liberty, not a Spirit-led liberty. Paul really has in mind the liberty of access. He's building on what he wrote in verse 12. We use great boldness of speech. Boldness is a word that belongs with liberty. Because of the great work of the Holy Spirit in us through the new covenant, we have a bold, liberated relationship with God. Verse 18. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So Paul is going to invite every Christian to a special, glorious intimacy with God. This is a relationship and transforming power that is not the property of just a few privileged Christians. It can belong to all, to everyone who has an unveiled face. So how do we get an unveiled face? When one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. That's in verse 16. So if we will turn to the Lord, he will take away the veil, and, this, uh, and we can be one of the we all. So we can see the glory of the Lord, but we can't see his glory perfectly. A mirror in the ancient world did not give nearly as good as reflection as our mirrors do today. Ancient mirrors were made out of polished metal and kind of gave a clouded, fuzzy, somewhat distorted image. Paul is saying that we can see the glory of the Lord, but we can't see it perfectly yet. We do that when we're glorified. And so, as we behold the glory of God, we will be transformed. God will change our lives and change us from the inside out. Through the Old Covenant, had its, uh, the Old Covenant did have its glory, but it can never transform lives through the law. God uses the New Covenant to make us transform people, not just nice people. So everybody wants to know, how can I change? Or everybody wants to know, how can they change? The best and most enduring change comes into our life when we are transformed by the time spent with the Lord. There are other ways to change, such as guilt, willpower, or coercion. But none of those methods are going to bring change that is as deep and lasts as long as the transformation that comes by the Spirit of God as we spend time in the presence of the Lord. Right? Staying in the Word. And so, yet it requires something, beholding. The word means more than just a casual look. It means to make a careful study. We all have something to behold, something to study. We can be transformed by the glory of the Lord, but only if we will carefully study it. And so as we look into God's mirror, we are changed into the same image of the Lord. When we spend time beholding the glory of God, uh, of love, grace, peace, and righteousness, we will see a transforming growth in love, grace, peace, and righteousness. And of course, this is how you can know someone is really spending time with the Lord. They are being transformed into that same image. However, much depends on what we see when we look into God's mirror. In this analogy, God's mirror is not a mirror that shows us uh, what we are as much as it shows us what we will become. And what we will become is based on our picture of who God is. If we have a false picture of God, then we will see that false picture in God's mirror and will be transformed into that same image, much to our harm, both for now and eternity. So thankfully, we don't have to be in bondage to a false image of ourselves or of God. When we behold the picture of God as he is in truth, we will be transformed into his image. This isn't God, uh, or this is God's great design in our salvation. 
for whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son Romans chapter 8 verse 29 and so the image of God which has been defaced by sin may be repaired within us the progress of this restoration is continuous throughout the whole of life because it is little by little that God causes his glory to shine forth in us and so this work of transformation is a process we are being transformed the work isn't complete yet and no one should expect it to be complete in themselves or in others no one comes away from one incredible time with the Lord perfectly transformed and so the work of transformation is a continual progression like sanctification it works from glory to glory it doesn't have to work from backsliding to glory to backsliding to glory God's work in our lives can be a continual progression from glory to glory so with these last words Paul is going to emphasize two things first this access to God and his transforming presence is ours by the new covenant because it's through the new covenant that we're given the spirit of the Lord secondly this work of transformation really is God's work in us it happens by the spirit of the Lord not by the will or effort of man we do not achieve or earn spiritual transformation by beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord we simply put ourselves in a place where the spirit of the Lord can transform us